Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we've wrapped up the Battle of Alberta for this year, and of course, the Calgary Flames are still sitting outside of a playoff spot as we uh, look down the stretch. The Oilers have won six of the of the season series ten against the Flames. I'm Dan, alongside Matt, and Matt, I guess all we've got to break down this week is two Battle of Alberta games. Yeah, and th- frankly, it's the end of the season for the Flames in terms of their postseason aspirations. But you know, say love you. You were talking last week about there's still a chance, there's still a chance. You know, if we wear a tinfoil hat and we stand on one foot on a Tuesday with a full moon, they could still make it. Are you convinced now we're out? Oh, for sure. And like it, it was one of those situations that between last show and today, we would have needed four of the five games to go our way just to have a shot. And only two of the five did, so there's just no time to make anything up. It's done, and yeah. And I believe right now our, what everyone's calling our tragic number is five, which means if we draw five points in any way, we're out of this for sure. Yeah, it, it's one of those situations where if the Flames win out and Montreal loses out, then the Flames will make the playoffs, and yeah, that's not going to happen. Well, let's take a look at the two games this week. On April 29th, uh, the Calgary Flames played against the Oilers. Um, our second to last game against the Oilers. This was in Win- in in Edmonton. Sorry, we took a quick road trip up north, and Calgary managed to get the win in this one—a three-to-one win over the Oilers. Lindholm scored twice, um, and McDavid was held without a point, which we don't see very often. The only Oilers scorer, James Neal. Which you know, that's exactly how you draw it up. Yep, and. Um, Calgary gets Calgary gets what I thought was a pretty good win against this one and or against the others in this one and and Matt is weird I feel like in the last couple weeks the Flames have started to play the way the Flames need to be playing and as I watch these games I sit here going where was this team a month ago two months ago like it seems like they finally started to get their game put together but it's too little too late yeah like frankly if this team had been in the midst of an 82 game schedule I would be absolutely shocked if the Flames failed to make the playoffs because they've been playing more of the solid 60-minute effort style of game. It's just that there are like 26 games fewer this year. And it's one of those things that the Flames would have easily been able to make up the four points or six points but there's just not enough time when you only have seven or eight games remaining. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. I think it's just too little, too late, and, um, you know, it's it's just, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's too bad that we have a shortened season because you're right. I think they could gain some ground if they need to. Yeah, and it's one of those things that in a lot of ways, like I'm more optimistic for next season than I was like even a month ago um, because of the fact that you're starting to see this team play more of an identity game. I agree and, with you there. Yeah, we're starting to see these guys can do it. I mean, you and I have had this discussion of what happened to this team. They're right on paper. Like, why is everybody sucking at once? And it just seems like it it seems like they for whatever reason it's the old Jerome McGinley thing you need till Christmas well these guys need seven seven eighths of the season but yeah well, you're right we're starting to establish an identity and establish a Sutter identity and a Sutter work ethic and it shows that there's good things that can happen next season yeah and like it, how would you say with how this season went like my initial reaction was like okay tear it down have like a mini rebuild and you know like reset with you know, like the three good defensemen, young defensemen as the, like your main defensemen, and you know, like more around the Munjapane, Dubé, Kachuk age group for up front, and you know, layer in the new guys as you draft them. And with how this team has responded to Daryl, I think that this team might be able to, if they are smart about it 
make a few tweaks to the roster and reset themselves and play a more full game next year. Yeah, I still think that there's some big changes that need to be made to this roster. I think it's time to oh, make some here. of those that we've been putting out, uh, you know, putting off for a while. And I think this is sort of the excuse to do it. But I agree with you. I think that it shows that the core of this roster is there. Maybe they just needed proper coaching or who knows what it is. But, um, yeah, I think it shows, you know, we've, we've still got the core that we need at least, you know, in, in its structure. It's like when you renovate a home, right? You can strip it down to its studs. The, the studs are still good at this point. Yeah, and it's one of those things that with how uh, contracts are structured and, you know, certain players will be moving on or have moved on, that it, it allows some more roster flexibility and financial flexibility for this team to, say, go out and get that right winger that they need at, or two and all that kind of stuff and maybe be able to keep most of everything intact and reset themselves for next year. Well, let's come back to that idea, but let's finish up talking about this week first. Um, yep. The ne the next game was the second game of this uh, Battle of Alberta mini series, and I guess the, the last one of the series, um, and that was played Saturday. So we had a one-day break, and then we played again in Edmonton against the Oilers, and this time didn't fare as well. Uh, this is a 4-1 to one win against the Flames. I don't think that the score sheet tells the story here. Two of those goals were empty net goals, so, I mean, it's not like we got that badly dominated by the, uh, the Oilers here. I guess the big thing that I would say in this one, the two people that have spoiled the Flames all season in this series were the spoilers again. Mike Smith, great in net. And uh, Connor McDavid, obviously, you know, doing the, the work that he needs to do for that team. He got uh, he, the first goal, he got an assist on the Bear goal, and an assist on the Archibald goal as well. So in it all night. But, you know, I thought the Flames looked good in the first, but they dug themselves into a two-goal deficit. And no matter how good your team is, when you dig yourself into a two-goal deficit, it's hard to come back. Yeah, and frankly, like after Montreal won their game like the flames just came out rather deflated because they really needed ottawa to win that game yesterday uh to keep the flames chances alive and it just was a kick to the team and uh, they just were flat frankly for the first half of the game and it, they went down to nothing. I think they only had like nine shots through the first 30 minutes. And it was not very good. And then Gaudreau scored a goal to get it within one. And then the Flames turned on the Jets to try and get the equalizer and ended up out shooting the Oilers. But uh, it's, it was just too little too late. And... You know, it's the, weird. If you look at the score sheet, and tell me if you see it the same way, but the Oilers scored their two goals in the first. I thought the Flames actually played the better first. The Flames got their one goal in the second. I thought the Oilers actually played the better second. Uh, I think that, yeah, I can see where you're coming from, but uh, when your season's on the line, like, frankly, I, I thought they got outplayed in the first and the second just because of the fact like context wise like they really needed to get the two points yesterday even with Montreal yeah, if you, winning if you kind of isolate the game though without the context just looking at those 60 minutes yeah and then in the third like you said the Flames turn the turn the Jets on and I think it's the same story we see so often in a lot of sports is you you're down, you're trying to get that win. And we've even seen it with the Flames. We talked about this again with the Montreal games. And they're trying so hard to to get another goal. I think they they just started to not play the game right. They were, you know, you'd say choking up on the bat too much in, in you know, hockey or in baseball or in football. You'd be running the safe, you know, running plays instead of throwing it. But I think they were trying to score too much. That they just weren't doing enough. Yeah, and, and, like, you see, like, teams that are successful generally, um, like, take a Boston or a Chicago when they were good, they would be playing their game for 60 minutes. And, like, even if they were trailing, they weren't 
panicking. It's like, oh, well, we have you right where we want you. And, you know, you have to defend against us. And you have to shut us down, not, oh, we need to force this play to get that goal. You know, there's a, always a calmness with mm -hmm. both Chicago and Boston. And other, you know, insert good teams throughout the various seasons. But, you know, Calgary, for the last three years, frankly, like, if you look back at the Colorado series... Like when they got flustered, they they couldn't find a calm for the rest of the series, and when Dallas got going, they couldn't find a calm and reset themselves. And this year, in so many games, they couldn't just calm themselves and reset. And I think that's a large uh, portion of a lack of maturity in this team, which I'm hoping that Daryl can work on with them to get them to settle down. And I, I think, Matt, that a lot of that probably comes down to as well. Just, um, you know, I think these players being confident in themselves too, right, and being confident in, in their team. And we've seen a lot of these guys not having great seasons, and they're behind the eight ball because of it. And I think if these guys are able to play a good season, I think that's definitely something that Daryl can emphasize, but I think it also comes naturally when you're when you're doing well. True. True, true. So, you know, I, I don't know how much that needs to be coaching them versus just fixing whatever it is that's going wrong, as my grandpa would say, between their ears. And I think, you know, the success comes and a lot of those things come when that happens. I agree. Well, with that, if we take a look at the Scotia North standings, as we do every week, the Calgary Flames still sit fifth. Uh, they have 47 points right now. Ottawa at 43. I didn't never thought I'd see the day Ottawa would move up from seventh, but Ottawa's now sixth uh, place with 43 points. Vancouver last place with 41 points. Montreal right above us at 55 points. So we have uh, six games left. So does Montreal. Doable, yes. Realistically, nope. So I think uh, I think now the question is, will Ottawa catch us? They have less games than us, but I think we probably see Calgary ending this season in fifth place in Scotia North. What do you think? Yeah. I, I think that both Ottawa and um, Vancouver have a greater chance of catching us than we have of catching Montreal at this point. I agree. And, you know, I mean, there's there's two ways to look at this, right? From a sort of a dignity standpoint, I want the Flames to, to finish fifth because you're like, wow, we're just out of the playoffs. From a draft lottery standpoint, Vancouver's got... 10 games left and they've got nine po and they're uh, six points down on us. Sure. Let's let them cat, you know, get up ahead of us and move down one. Yeah. And it's one of those things that with the draft lottery, it kind of, we don't know who's going to get the lucky spot. So, but even then, uh, if we move down one, our, our odds change, what 1.72% or something like that. So it really doesn't matter in the end. Yeah. True enough. You know, again, I'd almost rather than finish fifth, and it's not like we're gonna. It's not like we're gonna go from fifth to seventh, and even then, we're not the worst in the league. Um, it, you know, we're not getting anywhere near New Jersey, Buffalo, Anaheim, um, LA's behind us, uh, Columbus. You know, so I, you know, it's not like it's gonna do that much difference. So I think for me, and I've heard people talking about tanking and all that. I hate the idea of tanking. I think these Flames have to try and play this out. You know, try to be professionals and try to win, even if it's not mean anything standings wise. Do it for your personal, you know, standings. Do it for your personal statistics. Do it just because you're a professional and you want to show that you you're there to win. Yeah, I I think you know trying to tank is a, is a terrible idea. Yeah, it's one of those things that like it. It's not so much tanking if like say you play a whole bunch of Stockton guys to like audition them. You know, because they're getting an actual shot at For playing. For sure, and but, that I'm okay with. But, you know, to just outright, yeah, we don't care. Or if yeah, you just no. start sitting, you know, Goudreau, Monaghan, Kachuk, you know, those guys, and, and giving, you know, Nick Ritchie top-line minutes just to do it, that's more your tanking. 
But if you're going to replace those guys, like you said, with Stockton guys, and I'd say even then, you want to keep your your top guys in the lineup, move some of those middle six, bottom six guys out for Stockton guys, and yeah, see what they've got. And that's a useful, I would call it investment, into those players' development. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not tanking. It's seeing what you've got in Stockton and, and what we're capable of. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, like, I think that if there are any players that are, like, requiring surgery in the off season, that I think it might be best to shut them down. Yeah. Like, say, Monaghan, I think his wrist, I think, is a problem. and Especially yeah. if they're going to have to go to the States to get that surgery. There's probably still a quarantine on that, so shut them down now, send them off to wherever they need to go, get them in quarantine, and get that process started. Mm, I agree. And so we'll see. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting over the last six games to see exactly how the Flames manage their roster and how the new guys play. Because you you got to figure that some of the new kids are going to play. For sure. Um, we'll talk next week, and I'll promote this now, but we'll promote it again uh, later as well. But we actually will have Mike Gold, who's the Stockton Heat reporter for uh, Flames Nation on next week to talk with us about Stockton. And I think that's a great time to look at, you know, who he, he's someone who's followed the team closer than you and I have, but you know, who they should bring up, what we should expect to see from those guys, that sort of thing. But I agree with you, Matt. Now is the time to start seeing what those Stockton players have. And I think not only Stockton guys, I think this is the time to start shutting down um, Markstrom just because why put him in there and risk an injury. Even if he's, you know, even if he's not hurt yet, why let him get hurt? put Domingue in, put Zagadoulin in, put Parsons in. Like, I think it's just time to, and some people would say, well, if you're not playing him, you're tanking him, but that's an asset that we've invested long-term in. I think you've, that's just good asset management. Yeah, exactly. And it's not like it's going to make any, uh, any intrinsic difference to this team at this point. And well, I think, I think in some points need... the, the difference is you get to see what you have internally. We have no backup. So yeah. at least we get to figure out, do we have one internally or do we need to go shopping? Yeah, no, and that's what I was going to be saying is that like it makes no intrinsic difference to the team who's in that for the last handful of games, so why not? And like we've seen that in years gone by where like guys like Gillies would come up in the last game of the season or Leland Irving or you know whomever for a game just to get the nhl experience and you know it's one of those uh that you might as well run with everybody and give them a shot and i, I would actually more prefer if zagadulin and uh parsons got a shot than even deming well i think it depends if they think deming is a potential backup or not if they do then i think you've got to, i mean deming really hasn't played in the nhl in over a year so I think you then get him going if you're thinking he's going to be the guy that you want to resign. Um, and obviously the goaltending coaches and stuff have seen him at practice. They know more about him than we do. But I think that if, if Deming's your guy and you think he's your guy, you run him and you, you put you know one of the other guys on the bench next to him. Um, but I think, yeah, if you're, if you're saying, you know what, Deming isn't our guy, then I would agree with you. I think you put Zegadulin in, you put Parsons in, and you see which one of those guys, if either one is ready for the NHL jump or if they're staying at the AHL level. Next year, we're going to have Dustin Wolf uh, probably jumping into that same fray. So I think ideally you'd want to either move one of those guys up or move one of them on. I thought you're going to end up having, you know, probably Parsons at the ECHL level, which he's getting too old for that. So, yeah, there's going to be some goaltender management there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I would be not be surprised to see one of those goaltenders, um, you know, on the Flames bench very, very soon. Yeah, and hopefully this team can experiment with a handful of guys just to get a game or two in. Because at this point, why not? Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. I mean, it's it's the time to do that. And it, to me, it's not tanking. It's asset management. But I think now is the time you want to look at those assets, and it can't hurt. And at least you can see, you know, a lot of people are saying we should look at Phillips, or we should look at, you know, Zega Doolin or different guys. And we'll talk more with Mike next week on that. But, you know, I think we really have to ask ourselves, 
okay, it's great to see those guys at the AHL level and say, wow, they're looking good. Let's put them against NHL level guys and see how they look. And we we can all probably point back to six or eight guys that looked fantastic in the A and never translated well to the NHL. Yeah, exactly. And it, at least uh, it also gives uh, the kids a, a game in the NHL or two to see where they have to go in order to get to those next steps themselves so that way they can evolve as players into the next level. Yeah, I mean, you and I have talked with some of the players that, uh, you know, some of the, the prospect camps and whatnot who've had that NHL taste in the past, and some of them have even told us, and I've talked to some of them, uh, you know, in the Flames dressing room and whatnot. I remember talking to Dubé when he first came up and just, wow, it's so much faster. And, you know, I wasn't ready for that. My conditioning wasn't there, we've heard from guys in the past. And so just learning that, yeah, I've now got the summer to work on these things and I know what it's like. It's one thing to hear the old grizzled veteran, you know, sitting in the corner telling you the stories of what it takes. It's another to go do it, even for just one or two games. Yeah. You know, it's one thing for Alex Petrovic to be reminiscing about his time in the NHL. Another for you to get your own cup of coffee. And I, I think that's where we need to try out a bunch of these guys. And you know what? When I look at this lineup, I mean, there's so many guys, I think, even if you keep your top guys in there, because I think there's there's benefit to playing these guys with the top guys. But when I look at Buddy Robinson, Joachim Nordstrom, you know, there, there's guys you can easily take out of the lineup to fit um, young players in. Brett Ritchie. You can definitely fit some guys in there. Um, Nick, Nick, Rich, or sorry, yeah, uh, Brett Ritchie. But let me ask you a question. Speaking of Ritchie, um, we've seen in the in the last little bit the Monahan Goudreau pairing be still split up. Our top two lines recently have been uh, Goudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk on the first line, Monjapani, Monahan, and Ritchie on the second line, and then Dylan Dubé down on the third line with Backlund and Lucic. Matt, do you think that this is a sign? I mean. I think you and I could both say Brett Ritchie's more of a quote unquote Daryl Sutter type player than Dubé. Do you think that Nick Ritchie or Brett Ritchie, sorry, is up on the second line because he's a Sutter type player and Sutter wants wants to reward him because of that? Or do you think it's more trying to even out the grid on every line? You've got Ritchie there with Monahan and Mongepani because he provides some grit that, that line doesn't have otherwise. Well, also it's just due to a lack of other options, frankly. Like, Richie at least is a natural right winger. And yep. But if you're going to play Dubé on the right, you might as well play him on second line. Well, having Dubé with... Because Dubé is more of a defensive player in my mind uh, moving forward. And so having him learn from Backland, I think, is just more beneficial to him specifically. Like, I, if I was constructing the lines and, like, you're in a playoff push and all that, or in the postseason, I think you have Dubé on that second line. But with the educational emphasis, I think Dubé makes more sense with Backlund. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's, you know, Brett Ritchie is a guy that you would not look at any any team in this league and say, wow, there's your number two right winger, right? And I think that this is, like you said, it. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we just don't have a lot of options there. But I think it's also, it gives Mangiapane and Monaghan a bit of a policeman. And I think that's something that they need. And I think, you know, you you need a guy who can go in the corners, who can get that puck out, who can push it up to the other guys. That's not going to be the line you see next year. I mean, we've talked about no. the, the, I don't even think Richie's on the team next year. But I think that that's just, like you said, a lack of depth and a why not, right? It's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to help anything. Let's see what Brett Ritchie's got and let's see if we can keep him around. Yeah, exactly. And, like, you want to see if Ritchie's viable as a tryout guy next year or, a like, a one year for the fourth line or whatever or just move on outright. And, you know, Ritchie could be a, a very serviceable fourth liner for this team if they do go that route. He's almost our new Zach Ronaldo. I mean, Ronaldo came in and played more last year than I think we all thought he would, and he was well-liked by his teammates. And really, I think the reason that Ritchie's on that line is Sutter's rewarding hard workers. And anytime you listen to Daryl talk about Ritchie, he doesn't talk about what a great player he is. He talks about what a hard worker he is. And I think that putting him up on that second line is Daryl's way of trying to motivate some of these guys to say, work hard. You know, if Brett's working hard, he's up there. If you work hard, you'll be up there too. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I, I think that it's it's not necessarily saying anything about Dubé or that Sar doesn't like him. And really, I think sometimes when you push a guy too high up the lineup too early, you can ruin their development. And that's my worry with Dubé. I think Mongepani deserves top six minutes right now more than Dubé does just based on development. Um, but I think that Dubé, like you said, with Backlund is a great uh, pairing there. Having Lucic with those guys, to me, seems like a, a natural fit. Um on that left wing. And I think it'll help Dubé develop a little bit more having a reliable center like Backland playing with him and not trying to force Dubé into that um, scoring or playmaking role that I think he would be if he was with Mon and Monaghan. Yeah, and I think that, like, eventually uh, Dubé... I think the team is kind of thinking that he might be Backland's replacement in a year or two as, like, the solid second, third-line defensive two-way center. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I ever see him as a center. I think he's he's better as a winger, and we have no experience with him as a center yet either. But I think even, you know, down the road, playing on a line with, you know, let, let's, let's assume that our first line next year goes back to Johnny, Monty, Lindholm on the first line. So even if you had, you know, uh, Matthew Kachuk, Monjapani or Matthew Kachuk. I mean, if you do want Dubé, I think then you'd have Mon- Monjapani, Dubé, Kachuk potentially there. And and even that, you've got a little bit of everything, right? You've got the grit with Matty. You've got the, I'd say, more of the offensive-minded guy with the way they'd have Monjapani play. And then you've got the two-way guy who can get the puck and move it to the other two in Dubé. Yeah, I agree. And so we'll see. Like, there's lots of permutations with everything. Another sort of interesting question I wanted to ask you, I just asked you one about the lineup, but you and I have been talking a lot about who might stay and who might go this off season and what contracts you move. And I'm not saying I would do this, but I wanted to give you a bit of a thought experiment, Matt. Teams around the league are cash strapped. We know that we're going into the flat cap area, even with the new TV deal. Um, you know, we're, we don't have a lot of teams out there that have money to spend. If you're the Calgary flames, and you look at your roster and you say, what's the best bang for our buck? If we're going to sell one player and get the most return, what do you think the likelihood is that management looks at Lindholm and says at 4.8, everybody would be able to afford this guy and everybody would want him. Let's move him. Do you think that Lindholm at this point is untouchable? Or do you think that they look at him and say, this might be our best value trading chip if we want to make a big splash in the offseason? Well, it depends on philosophically what you want from this team moving forward like if you're going into a full teardown rebuild then you know trading Lindholm makes sense because you're going to get a ton of assets for him um if you're wanting to remain competitive in any way shape or form next season you have to keep Lindholm even even if you're going to rebuild though you always need the sort of veteran guys and at 26 Lindholm is a guy that I would still want to keep on my team for a rebuild he's got four more years in that deal i think you know even at that point you're not cash strapped you'd keep him around either way i agree um the only thing i like I, i'm trying to come up with a scenario in my head where they would move him because it is the best contract to move if you're trying to get value for dollars that's the best deal we've got to move to somebody else but i just i can't come up with a scenario where lindholm's not a flame next year yeah, same here. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should trade him. I don't want to get all the hate on Twitter and Facebook and that, but it's it's just kind of a thought experiment is it's the best value contract to move. What's the scenario yeah. where you move it? And, and to me, I mean, Lindholm hasn't looked as great as he has in the past this year, but a lot of our guys haven't, and we've talked about that. But if you look at his body of work as a flame, he's going to bounce back next year. And I think – I mean, you and I talked about how we're lacking right wingers already. I think the worst thing you do is get rid of a viable right winger. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like honestly, I think that it would be more likely that the Flames would move Matthew Kachuk than uh, at this point than Lindholm. Yeah, I, but again, if you want that young core, you don't move Kachuk either. True. At 23, even if you're going into a full rebuild, that's the guy who leads your team. That's your veteran. That's your captain. You know, like I, I can't, I can't see a scenario where either of those guys move. I agree. And and you and I have talked about. It. I think that there's still great value in uh, 
you know, a Monaghan contract or a Goudreau contract. And I think if you're going to move them, those are what gets moved out of the core. But I just, it, it's an interesting experience. Like even with Kachuk. So like you're saying, what's the scenario where Kachuk moves? Let's, let's go down that, that road. What, what do you get rid of Kachuk for? And what are you bringing in? That's so valuable that you had to move Maddie. Well, uh, honestly, I think that like if a trade of Kachuk happens, it will be because he requested it. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason that happened this season. But that can and, be true with any player, right? Yeah, and I I think that your return might be less than ideal in that situation. Well, but... as soon as a player asks for a trade, the the return always goes down. Unless you're Sam Bennett, where I th- we got more than we thought we would. You're always going down in value as soon as the guy asks for a trade. True, and I think that you're probably going to get multiple first or equivalent players um for Kachuk plus like legit NHL players as well so yeah it'll be a kind of like a whole shopping list of things I think that if it was just a one for whatever I think the Flames would be getting four or five good assets back if they so, move Kachuk so I mean outside of him asking for a trade outside Lindholm asking for a trade because I don't see either of those guys wanting out if you're, you know, true living, is there any scenario where you say, I need to improve my team, the right way to do it is Kachuk or Lindholm? Like, what would that return even look like? I can't even fathom what you would get for those guys you couldn't get for the other pieces we have. True. You know, like, whatever you might get for Lindholm, I think if you wanted it, you could get the same return, minus maybe a pick or whatever, for Johnny. Like, I don't think at this point we're trading for picks. We're trading for roster players. And I think whatever roster player you're going to get for Kachuk or Lindholm, you can get for Johnny. You can get for Monty. Yeah, I agree. You know, if we look at where our need is, we need right wing. If you're saying, I need to trade for a right winger. Well, if you're trading your right winger in Lindholm, now we got to trade for one more right winger. There's no sense in trading one right winger for a different right winger at this point because our right winger is serviceable. And if you're trading... Kachuk, who they've used the right winger and could be a number two right wing next year if they really need him to. Why? Like, it, it just, at that point, you're shaking up the team for the sake of shaking up the team. And I think you're going to put the team behind. You're you're going to get a lesser player back. Yeah, I think that, like, if the Flames do go deep down in that rabbit hole, that you're going to see, like, a three, four, five year rebuild by this team. And. You know, like but even just, then, both those guys I want for the rebuild, and I'll trade them in their last year. Yeah, I agree. You know, Lindholm's got four years left on his deal. If you want to get rid of him, he's he's going to still be a great value at, what, 30 at $4.8 million? Trade him then. That'll be a fantastic value. Kachuk's got two more years, and he's an RFA. If you're going to rebuild, you'll have all the money in the world because you'll be getting rid of other guys. Give Chucky whatever the man wants to stay here. But, mm-hmm. you know, you can't. If you get rid of those guys and you're trying to rebuild a 26 and 23 year old, now your rebuild is going to be 10 years instead of three or four. Matt, even if you want to rebuild and you're going to go the 10 year path, right? You can't. I mean, even look at Buffalo, right? The worst team in the league. They've got veterans. They've got Ocposo. They've got Hall. Like you're not going to to break your roster up. Then you're going the Edmonton route and having what one guy and a bunch of no names. You know, one guy and a bunch of farm guys like you you need even if you're going to be competitive you want those those farm let's just assume they're going to blow it all up and go full rebuild the you can't have the blind leading the blind as you've heard me say before you need some no, guys and, to lead this team yeah and the, like that's where um like i think that part of the problem with this team has been um the people instructing uh the uh current um players um they how do you say it? as a whole like you take it a guy like mark giordano and like he really didn't have any postseason experience because he was either hurt when they did or whatnot so like he had no idea like how you have to play in the playoffs in order to be successful because he just never had that opportunity and you know, like, I think that one of the things that'll be key for this team, whether they rebuild or retool or try to just, you know, go for it again next year, is getting people that have the idea of what it takes 
have been there and have some concept of all of the little things that you need to do in order to be successful to teach the guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan, Kachuk, Lindholm, etc. Like, what you actually need to do, because I, I still don't think that this team really has managed to find anybody who's a serviceable instructor on, like, what it actually takes. And that's part of the reason why I was excited when Daryl was hired, because he does. And at least there's one person who's been successful that actually knows how to both instruct and share his knowledge so let's go down this road this is an interesting discussion you've mentioned a lot during this season that maybe we blow it up maybe it's time to blow it up maybe it's time to you know go that route do you think that's the right way for the flames to go or do you think it's time to bring in veterans like daryl some guys in the ice and say you know what this team is with some changes is good enough we need veterans who know what they're doing and move forward that way well the thing is is that this if you had asked me, like, when the Flames were, like, in the free fall mode, uh, in that period just after they hired Daryl, I probably would have said, yeah, I think it's better to just, like, start making wholesale changes and, you know, like, tear down, get some good draft picks, and hopefully the new guys play good and go from there. And, but the thing is, is that, like, this team still has the same level of talent that they always have had. Like, they're a good team. They just need a few tweaks, I think, at this point. And realistically, value-wise for the players, it's not like their value is going to fall off the face of the earth. Uh, for Like, say, if you bring back Goudreau f for next season, well, he's still going to be a free agent at the end of the next year. So and in some ways, there's more value there because you can trade them as a rental. And I think with cap uncertainty, there might be more value to be had if you're willing to do that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like you're like go through the scenario, say the Flames suck again next year and are going to miss the playoffs again. You're going to trade Gaudreau at the deadline at, at that point, And you're going to get a first and probably a prospect or two uh, out of the deal. If you trade him at the draft, you're going to get the equivalent of a first and a prospect or two. You know, and, you know, it's one of those things where, like, value-wise, like, there is no real difference or upside to you as an organization to trade him now. It, unless he, again, unless players ask for trades, that's well, I, different. I think, the, but. I think the big value there becomes, can you get the piece you need on the right as a free agent or do you need to go out and, and trade a piece to get that piece yeah and i think that with the window to talk to free agents happening before the draft that they'll have a, an idea of like oh none of the good right wingers this year want to sign here yeah. well then we're, we need to address that another way and you know go from there yeah i, I don't think you're necessarily moving goudreau to get you know pieces or necessarily just move them out of town but you're looking at them as a valuable piece to get what you need and and will that will you add by subtracting will you get one better piece by getting rid of it or by changing it with a different piece yeah and like i think that like with how the flames have responded organizationally since over the past month or so it, where like you're starting to see a more of a cohesive thing um like this team is more reminding me of like the 0203 flames where when they hired daryl they sucked a bit off the hop but they started to play a little bit more cohesive uh down the stretch in 0203 and then when sutter got the opportunity to take over as head coach from the start of the year they managed to well be a lot more successful playoffs first time in seven years yada 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 how the playoffs turned out that's a besides the point in this situation but you know like they played better as a team overall and you know like if like the the amount of talent on this current iteration of the flames is vastly superior than what started the 0304 flame season and 
you know, if the Flames are playing that right way and they make the few adjustments, like, I think that they need to get two right-wingers in the offseason if they keep, like, if they keep everything more or less. And, you know, and that's I just doable. think you might have to move a roster piece to get those pieces. I don't know that we can just go out and buy them with... Are with what's available and with what we have for money, I think you might need to move a roster piece to get what you need. Oh, I agree. And that might be possible. It, You know, I think that um, having that extra year of development for Dubé and Manjapane will help. I think you're going to see them break out more next season. Um, I think you're going to see them both really establish themselves uh, like Majapane, I think you'll start seeing his, his name included in that foursome at making it a fivesome uh, for that level of talent in the player. And I think Dubé will bump himself up a, a little bit as well. So, Well, and both those guys have played primarily on the right side this year, and neither one is a right shot. So I think if you can get both those guys moved back to sort of their natural – the position be that center for Dubé if you want to look on that way, or both left wingers. I think that you you're giving them both a better chance to succeed. I agree, and it, that's where like you have to like with how this season broke down, um, it basically removed the emphasis on we need to absolutely keep you specifically to each of the players on the team because the whole team's broken, frankly. You know, you don't have, fall flat on your face like this if everything's working properly. So, it's one of those situations where, like, if any deal makes sense and in context and otherwise, then, you know, I, I really don't think that there are any untouchables on the team. No, I just, I wanted to bring it up because you've mentioned a lot on the show that maybe we just blow it up and get rid of everybody and start kind of fresh with a rebuild. I don't think now's the time for that. I think that's yeah ill-timed, I, and, and I think that this team still has enough life in them that with some tweaks and some upgrades on the right side, they can still, I'm not saying they're going to win the Cup next year, but then they can be back into contention. We've spent so long building this team, I think we need to give it that time to see the conclusion of, of Tree's work. Yeah. yeah, and I think that you'll see... You know, um, like, if this, this team doesn't respond and bounce back and, like, you, the young players progress, then you will see guys like Monaghan and Goudreau moved and at the and, deadline and otherwise. And, and while I say that, I feel like as much as we still have room to do, we're also, we need to keep a short leash for mediocrity. This team has never really performed the way it should. I mean, when was the last season that I'd say they performed the way they should? Even the year that we were top in the West, we were out in the first round. Like, I think that you're starting to see, and you mentioned a lot this season, we've upgraded the defense, we've upgraded the goaltending. I think we have the right forward core, except for the right wingers. I think now you go into this offseason saying there's one thing that really needs an upgrade the top two right positions. And I think after that, you've got to say if the, if this is still broken, then yeah, maybe we need to make some big changes. But I feel like we just need to, we have one more year of making tweaks, if you'll call them that, to fix our holes before you guys say, okay, now we've got what we need. Either we move forward or there is a bigger problem and we've got to pause. Yeah. Which, at that rate, then you're just going to be selling off things for assets and... Well, and yeah. by that point, a lot of your contracts are coming due, right? I mean, 2021, 22, you've got Kachuk coming due. You got Goudreau coming due. Like, I think you give it next season and say, do we do this? Or do we start selling those assets, like you said? Yeah. And you know, Monaghan, 2023. Lucic, 2023. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, all of those things start coming up. And then you can play, you know, because frankly like the actual dollars are an asset in and of themselves so you know just because it, it's sort of like when i said that like leaving uh, giordano exposed in the expansion draft it's not that oh well let's get rid of the captain it's well hey his six and a half million dollars can be reused somewhere yeah. else it's a strategic move it's almost too bad that geo has one more year because i feel like if he was done 
at the end of this year, you could probably get a great deal from next year. You know, you could probably get him to come back at like two. Yeah. But because he's got another year, it is. It's a burdensome contract. Yeah. And that's why I think that he'll get left exposed. I still don't, like, even if he does get exposed on the expansion draft, I don't think that he gets taken. No, I don't, I, I don't, I don't as, have as much of an issue exposing him. I just don't think he gets taken. I think yeah. if, if you're taking Geo from the Flames, you've miscalculated the value there. Mm-hmm. I still think Ryan gets taken because he's from the area. Yeah. I think you might end, you might end up with the, uh, the, Derek um, England. Exactly. Yeah, I was going to say the Vegas scenario. But, yeah, Derek England to Vegas because he's from Vegas. And I think there will be other veterans you look at putting your C on for the first couple of years. But we talked about that last week. We won't get into that again. Mm-hmm. Um, I figured before we end off this week, we don't have a ton more to talk about. Why don't we take a look at some of the Flames' unsigned prospects and where they'll likely be next year. There's been a lot of talk of, of Zari, Peltier, Kuznetsov, Wolf, a lot of these guys, and just kind of looking at who's eligible for what next year. What do you think, Matt? Sounds like a plan. If we take a look, we've got some guys that will be going back to the NCAA. Um, the guys that are likely headed back there are 2016 fifth rounder Mitchell Matson is heading back to Michigan State for his senior year. Uh, he doesn't need to be signed until 2022. There's a name that I even forgot was still Flames Properties, Mitch Matson. Like that was a 2016 fifth round pick. We're going into the off season of 2021. This is a guy that I have to question if there if he's even going to get signed in 2022. Like that just seems like. I don't know, kind of a wasted, uh, a, a wasted spot. Well, it doesn't hurt. Um, I would be absolutely floored if they signed him, though. The only time I could see him sign him is if they feel like they might need some AHL depth or ECHL depth at that point. I don't think he ever makes the NHL. But you know what? Maybe I mean you could say the same thing of of you know Philp, right? No one ever thought Philp would probably make it, but he's been useful farm depth. Yep. Um, then we have the 2018 fourth round pick, Demetrius Kuzmonsis. Nice guy. You and I have talked to him a number of times. Yep. Headed back to Arizona State for his senior year. Um, we have the 2019 fifth round pick, Josh Nodler, heading back to Michigan State for his junior year. And we have the 2020 third round pick, a guy I'm actually quite excited to see, and I wish we got to see him this summer at uh, Dev Camp, uh, Jake Boltman. Headed back to Notre Dame for his sophomore season. I've seen some of him online, and I like what I see. He's not eligible to be signed until 2025. Of those of those guys, there's nobody there in that list that I would say the Flames should try to end their college career early and turn them pro. I mean, I'm excited about Boltman, but the nice thing with um, NCAA players, you get longer than usual to sign those players. And I think just looking at where each one of them is when we have signed them, I think we're going to see other guys phased out by then. And, you know, even with Nodler and, you know, Boltman, I'd say leave all those guys in the in the uh, NCAA. Don't try to turn them pro early. There's yeah, nothing you really need there. I agree. You know, there's sometimes there's the one or two like Goudreau, right, where they tried to get him out of college early. I don't think there's anyone that we really need to end their college career early. Yeah, like Pedersen, the Flames did, uh, but that made sense as well. Yeah, there's certain guys that it makes sense for, but I don't think any of those guys you're really rushing into a pro gig. Yeah. Um, And then we got guys going back to junior. I know one guy that some Flames fans have been excited about is Jeremy Poirier, another defenseman, uh, 2020 third-round pick. He's uh, required to return to the QMJHL based on his age, but he could turn pro in 2022-2023. And our 2026-round pick, Rory Kearns, required to return to the OHL based on his age. Um, I would hate to be a guy returned to junior next year because you have no idea what condition any of these guys are going to be in. Some of them have played, some of them haven't, some have had starts and stops in their league. Like, I, I'm really hoping that both the Q and the O are going to have a really extended, uh, an extended, I, I guess, probably, I, I want to say camp, but I don't even know if it'll officially be a camp, but just a time to get these guys on the ice. Because you're going to have a lot of guys that aren't going to get as much play time in. Um, and then the next guy that's going back to the uh, potentially guy who could go pro, I believe this is Ryan Francis, eligible to return to the Q. Is it Ryan Francis? Who's Yeah, Cape Breton Eagles. Ryan Francis is eligible to return to the QMJHL as an overage player. He was our 143rd pick in 2020. 
Um, or he can go pro because he'll be 20 next year. The Flames don't need to sign him until 2022, but he's good enough they'll likely try to get him in Stockton in 2021-2022. And again, I'd say, you know what, as a, as a guy who's turning pro, might be better to, to turn pro next year and start that pro journey for, for I like Francis. I think he'd be yeah. – he, he's also a right winger, so might be good to get him into the system and get him going. Yeah, I agree. And then some guys going back to Europe. Our 2019 third-round picker, Ilya Nikolaev, is under contract to the KHLs. I always like to say these names. Lokomotiv Yaroslavl. Sounds – I hope I said that right. Um, for 2021-22, there's no transfer agreement with Russia, so the Flames hold his his rights indefinitely, which I, I have mixed thoughts on that. I think there's guys that's better just leave them in Russia and unless you need that spot because you can only have, what uh, – including your signed players and rights. I think you have 80 or 90 contracts total. So unless you need one of those, just hang on to the rights. Maybe they'll come over one day. Maybe they won't. But there's no point in trying to rush those guys out of Europe, I don't think, if they're in the KHL. It's a good enough league. You're getting some development out of that. And then 2020 second round, Emil Heinemann, uh, who we got from Florida. That was the guy who came back in the Bennett deal, uh, is under contract to the SHL. Uh, for next year. So the Flames have till 2024 to sign him. And again, from what I've seen and what I've heard of this guy, probably good to keep him over in the SHL and let him play at a high level. He'll probably get more dev there than he would shuffling into a very crowded Stockton forward core. Yep. Uh, then we have the 2019 fourth rounder, Lucas Fuke, who is on a short-term deal uh, this year in uh, the third-tier hockey at 10. I have no idea what league that is. I'll have to look it up. Um, he's now a free agent. Will probably land somewhere in the second tier over there. I think that's, um, I think that hockey Alislav is. Well, let me look it up before I. Yeah, the Elsven scan. That's the junior or the AHL level for in Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. So he's playing over in Sweden. So um, again, probably good to keep him over there. He his rights don't lapse till 2023. And then we have our fourth rounder, Daniel Chechaliv, who I think you were quite a fan of when we drafted this guy. Um, playing over in Europe as well as a goaltender, playing in Russia. Again, no transfer agreement with Russia, so a guy that will probably stay over there for a while. That's our, our European goaltender. Yeah, he had a good start to the season. He so. did. Um, and then the only guy with rights lapsing on this list is uh, 2017 seventh-round picks, Philip Spenningson. He's signed with Moto Hockey, a high-level team over there, through 2023-2024. The Flames hold his rights, and they lapse on June 1st. Um, and based on him re-signing with Moto, he will they will lapse his rights. So he'll become a free agent. And you know what? As much as I like Svenningson, I think that Svenningson could be useful over here. I'm not too concerned about his rights lapsing over there. I think, you know, there's always an opportunity to bring him as a free agent, but I think, again, he'll get more development playing at, in a high level with Moto than he would coming over and playing in the A. Yeah. So I think that's where he lets rights lapse, and you keep talking to him, and when he's ready, he feels ready to go to North America, hopefully you're the first team he reaches out to. Yeah. So I'm so just kind of wanted to give people a list of where those guys are at. Um, the guys that are ready to be pro next year and will probably turn pro are going to be Zari, Peltier, Kuznetsov, and Wolf. Um, those are all the guys that are signed and ready to go. And of those, Matt, I mean, looking at the roster and assuming we're not doing a full rebuild, do you see any of those guys playing in you know full time in Calgary next year? No, and even if uh, the they were doing a full teardown, I would still be shocked if any of them got more than a cup of coffee. I think the best thing for all their development right now is put them in the A. I think there's more to be gained, and, and what do I know? I'm not a GM, but then there's more to be gained being the big fish in the small pond of the AHL than being the third line guy playing eight minutes a night in the National Hockey League. Yeah, and uh, you look at guys like Dubé and Mangiapane, right? And they both played a while in the A until they showed that they were ready. And, like, I think Zari and Peltier are both going to be in the NHL sooner than later. But I think at least a half season to a full year in Stockton or wherever um, will help them facilitate their development more than... You know, and then ease them into the lineup when we get them up here and, like, fourth-line guys until, you know, and basically mirror exactly the progression with Dubé and Manjapane. 
Well, you've heard me say it before, and, you know, talking about Bennett and the trade that we made, Ben, I still think that Sam Bennett would have been better served with AHL time. I think we rushed him into the NHL and maybe wasn't ready for it, and I see no reason besides fans want to see those guys that we need to rush them. They're not going to fill a hole that we need, so I'd rather put them into the AHL. Like you said, give them a year. I wouldn't even say a half year. I think all those guys and where we're going to be at roster-wise will get and should get a full year at least development in the AHL to prove themselves. Yeah, I agree. You know, there's there's not – I can't see any hole those guys would fill. I mean, if we're not looking at them as top six guys, I don't see any hole those guys could fill that we couldn't go out and get a cheap free agent for, a Josh Levo or, a, you know, whoever you might want to put in there. You know, we have Simone and guys like that who – I. I don't think those guys are going to do any worse than Peltier and Zari did. And even when you're talking about fourth line, I also think sometimes you have to, when you call guys up, put them like for like. It's a different preparation for a game when you're getting ready for a game as a first liner playing, you know, 10, 10 minutes a night or 20 minutes a night. And I think, um, I think that you can't bring a guy up, you know, when he's, used to playing first line minutes 12 minutes probably not 20 but let's say 12 to 15 and then you're putting them on for four minutes i think if you're going to bring those guys up you kind of have to bring them up into an injury spot in your you know your middle six lines to really let see what that player is because they're used to playing that and they're used to prepping that and that's going to give you the best apples to apples comparison yeah i can see that you know, that, that's kind of my thought, is you can't bring in a fourth-line guy, just like you wouldn't bring in a fourth-line guy, a Garnet Hathaway, or, you know, anyone like that, and say, okay, go play first-line minutes, kid, because they're not used to that. They're not prepped for that. What, like Brett Ritchie? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, you know. But I think, you know, even guys like Ritchie, though, I think we're surprised, because a lot of times they play more senior roles in the AHL, so they get used to playing those kind of minutes at a lower league, right? True. But, yeah, no, you're, you're right. I think Richie's one of those guys. So I, I I look at it that when you're bringing a guy up from the A, if you really want to assess them, you've got to bring them into a like position, right? Not saying you bring them in only if, say, Goudreau or Kachuk gets hurt. But if there's a guy you see playing top six minutes, you bring him in to play top six minutes on an injury. If it's a guy you think is your bottom six player, your fourth line player, then sure, bring him up and put them in fourth line minutes because you're going to get the proper evaluation of them. Yeah, I can see that. So that's why I think you leave all those guys in the AHL unless, you know, like unless there's an injury or something like that um, because you're just, you want to evaluate them properly. So that kind of wraps up the guys that aren't in the, aren't in the NHL or the AHL. We'll talk next week about some of the AHL guys when we bring on uh, Mike Gold from Flames Nation. He's scheduled to join us next week to talk about the Stockton Heat and uh, where, where they're at and what we can expect to see from some of those players next year or if they get called up this year. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We'll be promoting that throughout the week. And if you have any questions for Mike, feel free to send to us through Twitter, Facebook, our website, whatever. Um, but we'd love to have your questions from Mike when he comes on. And Matt, I guess that kind of takes us to the prediction game, or we have one game to predict this week. Loss. It's, uh, it's quite the week for Flames hockey. One single game. We have a three-day break and a three-day break on either side of it. Last week, I predicted a win and a loss, and you predicted two wins. So I won last week. Puts me at a 6 nothing lead here. I wish the Flames could get a 6 nothing lead. Yeah. And you're predicting the one game this week against Winnipeg is a loss. And you know that even with there only being one game, I will still... Have a zero. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No matter which one way I pick it, it will be the exact opposite. Now, do you think it's going to be? Do you think that it's going to be a regulation loss or an overtime loss? Regulation. If you're going to do it, do it right. I have mixed feelings on this one. As much as my my gut tells me it's going to be a loss, my brain tells me with a three day break, Sutter's going to get these guys hyped up to say you're playing right. Beat Winnipeg. Like, you're doing all the right things. Go out there, give it your all, and beat Winnipeg. It's the only real game that matters anymore. So, my, I guess that side of me is saying I think they could maybe take it to overtime. I also think Winnipeg's going to start shutting some of their guys down, and Hellebuck hasn't looked great lately. So, I think that they might get an overtime loss in this one, but I'm going to be bold, and I'm going to say they're going to win against Winnipeg. Yeah. And so, I look forward to you going up 7 nothing. <laughs> 
And, and then uh, we'll record next Sunday before the Ottawa game, which is a 6 o'clock start. So that gives us, like I said, only the game on the 5th here in Calgary against Winnipeg, 7.30 p.m. start um, in Calgary. And, and really, there's only six games left. We got Winnipeg, Ottawa, and then four against Vancouver. That may or may not even get played. So let's talk about this. You and I talked about this before we went on the show tonight. So you were saying, and I've said in the past they might not get played, but the more I think about it and the more I read, the league really wants them to be played, and it makes sense because you'd hate for a guy to be close to a milestone of some kind and he doesn't get it because he just shuts. they shut the league down. Unless there's a COVID outbreak, which based on our Alberta numbers right now, there could be on this team. We've seen in the past where the Flames have been out and they played other teams that are out to complete the 82-game schedule. We never have shut the league down prematurely before. I don't see why you would now. I think it makes sense to play these out and get guys their numbers. Well, the only reason why I think it might be a possibility is just due to the fact that three of the games are after everybody else has finished their season. And so, like, we'd be basically holding up the playoffs to play games that don't actually matter at all. Yeah, I can see that, but uh, and we also don't know what the playoffs. I mean, we know where the playoffs are going to be. We know they're going to be um, inter, you know, interdivisional. There's been some talk they might have to go bubble if there's outbreaks, but I also can't see the other GM saying, "Please, don't give us a couple extra days break." And even then, Matt, we don't need to hold up the playoffs. Neither of these teams have an opponent waiting for them. There's theoretically no reason you couldn't have us play while the playoffs are going on. That would be really bizarre, though. But what hasn't been bizarre about this season? True. True even enough. if you have to take a, even if you got to take a week, I think by the time you, tran, you know, you move from one side of the country to the other, let's say Winnipeg goes to Toronto to play their game or whatever it might be, um, I think that the teams would welcome some extra time to get to their new surroundings, get comfortable with them, you know, that sort of thing. I think it makes sense to. To keep the uh, you know to keep those games, just play them out and start the playoffs a little bit later. What where have we got to go? Yeah, true enough. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of starts and stops of the playoffs, especially as we start to get outside of our bubbles. Like round two, you're probably going to be playing somebody outside your bubble, um, if not you know round three for sure. Oh no, I guess round two you'll still be in your bubble. Round three you'll be outside your bubble, and round four you'll be outside your bubble. So we're going to have to have, you know, weak stops and starts between those anyways, probably. Yeah, something like that. Right, because by the time the North Division's done and we have a North Division champion, they're going to have to play someone they've never played before, and there's going to be a quarantine period. Well, that'll be interesting, because you couldn't play two here, you know, two at home, two on the road. You'd have a week between them. So it'll be interesting to see what the league does there. Yeah. You may almost have to shut everything down for two weeks and re-quarantine everybody and go again it'll be it'll be interesting i never thought about that till now it'll be interesting to see what they would do yeah the playoffs are going to be weird i think and i think also weird because of the canadian teams and we're so much uh further behind with our vaccines in the states and i think that's going to affect things as well yeah well and you look at like how the toronto blue jays are playing out of buffalo this year uh and until further notice, I think that, you know, it's going to cause some problems when Canada does play the United States on exactly all of the procedures and such. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I don't know, we'll talk about that later, but I think that as we move out of our our Canadian bubble, that's going to be the issue, because I can start to see the U.S. allow some more free travel there, but having the Canadian team that's moving on to play one American team will be the issue. Mm. And that's where having a bubble might work. Or like you said, maybe they just put that Canadian team in the States. It's not like if you win it at home, you're winning it for your fans anyways. Yeah, exactly. Like the Florida Panthers have one of the highest attendance in the NHL. Yeah. But you know, thinking about it out loud, that makes sense is just whoever wins the Canadian division gets, you know, America gets a, a home ice in the States. Just pick one of the teams not playing and give them that home ice. Or just play out of the same rink. It really doesn't matter. Send them to whatever rink and just alternate jersey colors. Yeah. Oh, you're going to play Colorado. Good. You know, go to Denver and just hang out at the Pepsi Center. There you go. Yeah. 
So we'll we'll see what happens with the playoffs as we get that far, but let's get through the season before we talk too much about the playoffs. Yeah. So, Matt, enjoy the one game this week. It's weird to talk about. It's A, weird to be talking about Flames hockey in May, and B, weird to be talking about one game in a week. Yeah, and then not game seven of a series or, you know. Yeah, I guess that would be, uh, well, I guess, yeah, this would be about the time we'd be starting the playoffs usually. Yeah. No, I guess we'd probably be about the end of week because usually we're done the first week of April for the NHL. So, yeah, this would be about the you know start of C- Series 2 or the end of Series 1. Yeah. And with only one game on the dock, it, it, you know, it would definitely make sense. But, yeah. So send, Certain... in, send in your questions for Mike next week because we're going to need a lot of time to fill. Yeah. What, well, Matt, we're not we're not going to spend an hour breaking down the Jets game? Like, you know, maybe how, maybe, how, how maybe we should just do li- live commentary of the game for 60 minutes and roll that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what was that? <laughs> and repeat. <laughs> That's right. And then uh, next week we can talk about will the Flames win or lose the last game to Ottawa, but that'll be next week's problem. Matt, do you want to take us out? As always, good or bad, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.